Over the years, the Call of Duty franchise has developed two distinct identities. The first, and probably more well-known, is the Modern Warfare identity. Developed by Infinity Ward and starting with Call of Duty 4 way back in 2007, this is a series that's set in modern day and aims to capture boots-on-the-ground tactical warfare. The other Call of Duty identity is that of the Black Ops series. Starting with the original Black Ops in 2010 and developed by Treyarch, this one is a little less defined, but it's normally a little more wacky and arcadey with a zombies mode, alternate history storylines, and even the occasional jetpack. COD has relied very heavily on these two sub-franchises ever since their respective breakout successes, with five entries in each one at the time of recording this video. But there was a time when Activision tried to move on from these franchises when it seemed like they had run their course. That's when we got games like Ghosts, Advanced Warfare, Infinite Warfare, and World War II. And even though those games weren't financial failures, they still weren't living up to the records that were set in the golden era of COD. So with the overall trajectory of the franchise pointed downward, it was time to do something drastic. Activision gave in and rebooted the Modern Warfare series in 2019, and Soft rebooted the Black Ops series in 2020. These are the franchises that people know and love, and bringing them back proved to be very successful for Activision. But the question lingered. Did this mean that Call of Duty would never be able to create another hit franchise like Black Ops or Modern Warfare? Would we be stuck in an endless cycle of reboots and sequels? Enter Call of Duty 2021, a completely new title, not a sequel not a reboot. Something that's rare not only within the COD franchise, but within the entertainment industry as a whole. Call of Duty 2021 was to be developed by Sledgehammer, the red-headed stepchild of Call of Duty developers. If you watched my Black Ops Cold War video last year, you'll remember that that game was originally supposed to be a Sledgehammer-led project. And we don't know too many details about what happened, but apparently development of the game was going so poorly that Activision called on Treyarch to help finish the game and repurpose everything Sledgehammer had made as a new Black Ops title. This was an ugly situation as it resulted in a half-baked Black Ops game and also looked pretty bad on Sledgehammer's part. But 2021 was to be the year of their redemption, since they were given another chance to take the lead on a Call of Duty game. A game that wouldn't rely on the Modern Warfare or Black Ops banner, giving Sledgehammer the freedom to create their own Call of Duty identity. And thus was born Call of Duty Vanguard. The game got off to a rough start before the official reveal even happened when it leaked that Call of Duty would be going back to a World War II setting. World War II has been beaten to death by movies, video games, and even COD itself. Call of Duty 1, 2, 3, and 5 were all World War II games, and then more recently we had the brilliantly titled Call of Duty World War II serve as a return to the setting, a game that was also developed by Sledgehammer. So needless to say, Call of Duty has done a lot with World War II. You might even say it's done everything that it can with World War II. And that's why the reception to the setting was pretty bad. But all the same, the rumors proved to be true when the game was officially revealed on August 19th, 2021. The purpose of this video is to be a retrospective look at the game. As always, I've waited until the end of the game's one-year life cycle so that we have the complete picture to draw from. And we will be breaking the video into three sections since the game has three main ways to play. Campaign, Zombies, and Multiplayer. But before we jump in, let's tackle some things that apply to all three sections, starting with the visuals. Call of Duty Vanguard runs on Infinity Ward's IW8 engine, the same one that Modern Warfare 2019 was made in. While I think that is an important detail, I get the impression that a lot of people don't understand what purpose a game's engine serves. For example, when the news broke that this game would use MW19's engine, everyone assumed that it meant that this game would play just like MW19, which isn't necessarily true. Of course, the game did end up playing very similarly to MW19, but that's not because of the IW8 engine. That's just the way that Sledgehammer designed the game. But the engine does affect things like how the game is made and the fidelity and performance of the game. So with that in mind, I think using this engine was a a great choice on Sledgehammer's part, since the IW8 seems to be the most refined engine that's ever been made for the franchise. I think the game looks pretty good. I'd say it looks better than Black Ops Cold War did, but still not quite as good as MW19. Vanguard's graphics look a little smooth and cartoony to me, where Modern Warfare had this incredible photorealistic look that I don't think has been topped since. However, Vanguard does employ much more color than MW19 did, which I always enjoy. The animations are also a step up from Black Ops Cold War, but not quite on the level of MW19. You can tell that Sledgehammer was definitely inspired by what Infinity War did 
did in 2019. Adding more camera shake to reload animations, more realistic wobbling in the hands of the operators, and in general just making them more snappy and satisfying. They don't look as professional as they did in Modern Warfare 2019, but it's possible that this was intentional, since the World War II setting of the game means that these operators aren't all highly trained experts like they are in the Modern Warfare games. The audio was also good, not great. I think I'm starting to see a pattern emerge here. The guns have a very light sound to them, which might be historically accurate, I have no idea, we'll talk more about that in a second, but compared to how bassy guns sounded in MW19, for example, these ones come off as a little underwhelming. The audio in general is not outstanding, but it is serviceable. Before we jump into the campaign, I do have one disclaimer that I want to make about historical accuracy. This game is not historically accurate, and to be frank, it doesn't even try to be. Like I said, I'm not a World War II expert, so I can't speak to exactly how inaccurate it is, but for me personally, it hardly matters. I know a lot of people were really bothered by the historical inaccuracy of the game, and I do think that's a valid complaint, especially if you bought the game expecting an authentic World War II experience. But luckily for people like me, Vanguard prioritizes gameplay over historical accuracy. And while there are some things about the general lack of theme in the game that do bother me, which we'll get into, I really couldn't care less about the game's historical accuracy. Were soldiers using red dot sights in World War II? Definitely not. Do I want the option to use a red dot sight in Call of Duty multiplayer? Absolutely. In fact, if it were me making decisions at Activision, I would have fully embraced this idea and made the game take place in an alternate timeline World War II. Think Wolfenstein, if you're familiar with those games. I'd make a cool blend of sci-fi and alternate history, kind of like an entire game of how the zombie storyline was in Call of Duty World at War, with teleporters and the Wonder Waff. Now that would have been cool. But that's unfortunately beside the point. Within the context of Call of Duty, I don't care much for realism. And that's why throughout the rest of this video, I won't be mentioning whether or not something is historically accurate, and I won't be holding any inaccuracies against the game. I'll simply be judging it by its gameplay merit. So let's kick things off with the campaign. I'll save you all some time and say that there's not really anything interesting going on in this campaign. But that's not to say that I hated it, because I didn't. The campaign follows Task Force Vanguard, the very first specialized task force Force around the end of World War II. The story starts with the group getting captured by Germans, and then the plot slowly advances as we get flashbacks for each individual character, showing their backstory, how they met, and what makes them all unique. This means that for almost all of the story, the characters are actually imprisoned, and most of the story is told via flashbacks. It feels like they were going for an Avengers type thing here, where you have each character's origin story, and then they all come together to form a super team. Which isn't a bad idea, I mean, I do like a good team-up story, but the writing here is pretty boring. They set out to create iconic Call of Duty characters, as writer Sam Maggs puts it. You don't really have that in Call of Duty right now. You know, when you think about um, a game like, I don't know, Halo, you think of Master Chief or whatever, but when you think of COD, there's really that standout, like, oh, these characters. This quote is kind of embarrassing when you consider how awesome and popular characters like Frank Woods and Captain Price are among the community, but I suppose it's a noble pursuit. Did they achieve anything even remotely close to this? Without hesitation, no they did not. So story-wise, it was a bit of a flop. Each year, Call of Duty will add a number of gimmicks to the campaign, the type of thing that doesn't actually shake up the gameplay that much, but allows them to market the campaign as something fresh. This year we had looting dead bodies, climbing up walls that have these super video gamey bricks sticking out of them, and when you're playing as Kingsley, the leader of Task Force Vanguard, you can command your soldiers to do specific things. I think all of these ideas are good ones, but the implementation for all of them is pretty weak. You can only call out orders when the game prompts you to. You seldom get a chance to make a conscious, meaningful decision with your orders. Usually it comes down to being pinned in a certain area, and you have to order your soldiers to do something that will help you move forward. So not a lot of freedom, but I guess it still does feel cool from time to time. Looting bodies for ammo is also a cool idea, it just never feels like you have to do it, or are rewarded for it. It'd be a nice twist on things if you had to be resourceful, watch your ammo count, use your bullets wisely, and then loot up wherever you could. This mechanic could have added another layer to the gameplay and help it break away from the usual mindless shooting, but with the way that 
that it was actually implemented, it feels like all you're doing is getting some bonus bullets, which never really come into play. And in keeping with the theme, the wall climbing was also a good idea, but half-baked. If it felt more fluid to where it was quick and freeform, kind of like Assassin's Creed or Mirror's Edge, that would have been amazing. But what we got really just feels more like interacting with a special wall that triggers a cutscene of you climbing up. I know it's probably asking too much for a Call of Duty campaign to include a fleshed out parkour system, but having something like this in the game just leaves a lot to be desired. There's a mission where you're playing as Paulina as her hometown is attacked, and there's this awesome moment where you're parkouring over the rooftops while the city is under fire. This was probably my favorite moment of the campaign. It was intense, cinematic, and also emotional watching her hometown get destroyed. And it was fun having this moment centered around movement and not gunfights like everything else usually is. I just wish there was a little more depth to the climbing mechanics here. To me, the most memorable Call of Duty campaign missions are ironically the ones that break away the most from the run and gun formula, which explains why I loved Black Ops Cold War's campaign so much, as it had a number of unique and mind-bending missions. Vanguard, on the other hand, very rarely breaks away from that traditional, extremely linear style of gameplay, which is what makes it kind of a snooze fest. Overall, this campaign will probably be one of the most forgettable Call of Duty campaigns ever, with not only boring writing, but also boring gameplay as well. Even the more hated Call of Duties like Ghosts or Infinite Warfare had campaigns that people still talk about to this day, and me personally, I'm still crossing my fingers for Ghosts 2 so we can finally see how that story continues. But I really doubt that anyone will be awaiting the return of Task Force Vanguard, even though supposedly Sledgehammer was planning this story to be the first part of a trilogy. So that does it for Vanguard's campaign, let's move on to the quote-unquote zombies mode. I'm gonna keep the zombies section short and simple for two reasons. Number one, this year's zombies mode hasn't really changed my overall thoughts on the state of zombies in COD, so if you want to hear more about that then you can check out last year's video on Black Ops Cold War. And number two, this is the first time ever that I was simply not interested in this mode at all. I did hop in a few times just to get a feel for what it's like and how everything works, but I probably only clocked in a few hours over the course of the year. The good news is that this year's Zombies mode was developed by Treyarch, the godfather of Call of Duty Zombies. The bad news is that it seems like Treyarch has really lost the plot. This iteration of Zombies is hub-based, as opposed to the traditional round-based. What this means is that instead of there being distinct rounds of zombies, zombies to simply fight off, there's objectives around the map that you go out and do at your own leisure. And in between doing all those objectives, you'll be in a hub area where you can buy all your upgrades. If you played Outbreak from Cold War Zombies, it's basically that, but on a smaller map. Now I have a lot of issues with this style of zombies gameplay that I could go on about for hours, but the TLDR is that this slaughters the pacing that made classic zombies so fun. Dropping into the game with only a pistol and unlocking more of the map and upgrading your weapons as the game progresses. Zombies used to have this phasic structure, which for a number of reasons just doesn't exist in Vanguard. And that's not all, my problems with this year's zombies do go beyond just the gameplay. The new narrative is just as boring and uninspired as Vanguard's campaign. The old aesthetic of zombies, which included perks of cola, gobble gums, and pack-a-punch, each of which were iconic and bursting with fun personality, has been replaced with a new demonic theme, which I'm sure you'll forget all about by this time tomorrow. Tomorrow. Again, I could go on about all this, but I think it suffices to say that the gameplay elements that made the game fun are no longer there, and the charming aesthetic that made me fall in love with zombies is also long gone. Last year I said that Zombies was ripe for a reboot, which would take the game back to its most classic and basic state and then build it up again from there, and I still feel the same way now. Zombies mode is what initially got me into Call of Duty way back in World at War, so it will always have a special place in my heart. But Vanguard Zombies I think marks a new low for the game mode. Here's to hoping it rounds the corner soon. And now for the main event multiplayer. As you all know, I judge each Call of Duty game by my 80-20 rule, which is that the multiplayer will account for 80% of my overall opinion on the game, while everything else the game has to offer accounts for the remaining 20. So what I'm trying to say is that multiplayer is the most important part of any Call of Duty to me personally, by a large margin. So let's start by breaking down one of the most critical elements of any Call of Duty multiplayer, the movement. Movement in Vanguard is fast and fluid. New gunsmith attached 
attachments and the return of the Lightweight perk, which hasn't been in the game since Black Ops 4, allow you to move exceptionally quick in this game. Sliding isn't as effective as it was in Cold War, but with the return of MW19 style slide cancelling, it does become pretty useful. You can bunny hop to maintain speed while ADS, but you can't drop shot as you're forced out of ADS anytime you go prone. And there's also a nasty accuracy debuff anytime you change your stance at all. Tactical Sprint from MW19 also makes a return, which I'm happy about because I wasn't a fan of Black Ops Cold War's sprint takeoff mechanic. In short, this is basically MW19 movement minus drop shotting plus some base movement speed. To me, this is essentially heaven. The movement is without a doubt my favorite thing about Vanguard. Sure, I would have liked to be able to drop shot even if it was just through an attachment like we saw in Black Ops Cold War, but that's just a minor thing. I love the feeling of momentum you have when moving in this game. And I always appreciate movement tech like bunny hopping or slide cancelling to help raise that skill ceiling just a tad. I know that a lot of COD players are sick of slide cancelling nowadays, but I have to admit that I've always liked it and I still do. But I also have to admit that I think the way that it returned in this game is a little odd. Slide cancelling is an exploit that was discovered by players in Modern Warfare 2019. You'd think that Infinity Ward would have patched it out back then, but they didn't for whatever reason. It wasn't possible in Black Ops Cold War, which makes sense, but all of a sudden in Vanguard, it is again. I just feel like they need to pick a lane. Either slide cancelling is an exploit and shouldn't exist in the game at all, or it should be fleshed out and made into an official feature. Imagine if there were UI elements to help you time your slide cancel. If you time it right, then you get a speed boost. If you time it wrong, you get a speed reduction. If you don't want to use it, then you don't have to, but for the players who are willing to take on that risk, the option is there. This is exactly the kind of skill gap that I would love to exist in Call of Duty, and I don't know if it ever will, but slide cancelling was at least something similar. Still, overall, I'm more than happy with this movement. I don't want to give Sledgehammer too much credit since it's basically Infinity Ward's creation, but that doesn't make it any less fun. The time to kill in Vanguard is interesting. If you're using a gun without any attachments, you'll find that the TTK feels pretty average for Call of Duty. But gun attachments in Vanguard with its new gunsmith are more powerful than we've ever seen before. I'm gonna throw a graph up on the screen from one of my favorite Call of Duty YouTubers, The Exclusive Ace, that shows the average close range time to kill in every Call of Duty since COD 4 in milliseconds. The blue bars being without any attachments, and the green bars including any attachments that increase your damage per bullet. Taking a look, you'll see that without attachments, Vanguard's TTK is actually quite slower than MW19's. However, once you throw those attachments into the mix, we're looking at an average TTK even faster than MW19's, which was already arguably too fast to begin with. And taking a look at the larger picture, you can see that the potential TTK in Vanguard is the fastest since Ghosts, which had an infamously quick time to kill. And your actual experienced time to kill in the game may end up feeling even faster as the movement is so fast that people can pop around corners and delete you in an instant, and also recoil is very easy to manage in this game. A lot of people took issue with this extreme TTK, and while I didn't love it, it also didn't ruin the experience for me. In my Black Ops Cold War video, we talked about how I didn't like the way they balanced the game for a longer TTK, and that Call of Duty, in my opinion, usually lends itself to a quicker TTK. I guess, be careful what you wish for, because that's what we got here. I think they both had their flaws, and I feel like my ideal Call of Duty game would probably land somewhere in between the two of them. And with those basics out of the way, let's go over the quirks, gimmicks, and new features that Sledgehammer added to this year's multiplayer. First up, mounted sliding. If you played MW19, you'll remember a new mounting mechanic that was added to the game. If you were near a ledge, you could mount your weapon on it, and it would give you increased recoil control at the cost of being locked in place. This was kind of a controversial mechanic since it rewarded staying in one place and locking down a single line of sight. Mounting returned in Vanguard, but this time you can actually slide side to side while you're mounted. And this makes me think that either me or Sledgehammer did not understand what the point of mounting was in MW19. It was my understanding that what balanced out the insane recoil control you get while mounted was the fact that you couldn't move around, making you easier to hit. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Giving you the ability to move around while mounted kind of defeats the purpose. And when this was announced before the game even came out, people already hated it since it sounded like MW19 mounting, but worse. But it's all the same because I don't think it ended up being too overpowered or even changing the gameplay in any significant way. I just think 
think it was an odd choice. And going along with that is another new mechanic, blind firing. Kind of similar to something that you would see in a World War II movie, this is when your operator points their gun around cover and fires it without looking. Or at least that's how you would assume it works with a name like blind fire, but the kicker is that you actually can see where your gun is firing, it just won't be very accurate. It's essentially shooting from the hip from cover. Again, it feels like it defeats the purpose if blind fire isn't actually blind. A different version of this mechanic where you couldn't see what you were shooting at and had to use your spidey senses instead actually could have been pretty cool. But with the implementation that we got, it just feels kind of pointless. In what case is using this mechanic going to be a better option than just hip firing or aiming down sights? Both blind firing and mounted sliding to me just seem like marketing gimmicks. They sounded cool and flashy leading up to the game, but ended up having a very minimal effect on gameplay. Breakable walls, on the other hand, I actually thought were pretty cool. These are special walls that Sledgehammer put into the game that will break away when they take damage. So for example, in Eagle's Nest, the center area has a lot of these breakable walls, and throughout the game, more and more of the walls get torn down. I like how it changes the flow of the map as the match progresses, and also I think it feels pretty cool when you're mowing someone down through a breakaway wall. And that segues nicely into the next thing I wanted to mention, which is visibility. Now this wasn't marketed as a feature of the game or anything, but after playing it for a year, I think it's pretty clear that this was intentional. Between all the explosions, smoke, fire, muzzle flash, breakaway walls, and plenty of other things, visibility in Vanguard can get pretty bad. When you're in the middle of a mortar barrage, for example, it can be extremely disorienting and the smoke and stuff can almost block your vision entirely. I know a lot of people hated this, but I actually thought it had some nice charm to it. It's so chaotic and wild, it really makes you feel like you're in the middle of a war. And sure, it can be annoying when you can't see the enemy player, but as long as the poor visibility is going both ways, then it doesn't bother me too much. This is one of those things that I'm happy they played around with, and I think gave some unique personality to Vanguard, but I'm not hoping that it becomes the norm. Something else that I guess is somewhat related to visibility is the lack of factions in the game. So normally Call of Duty has two separate pools of operators, one for each team in any given match, making it easier to recognize who's on your team and who isn't. In Vanguard, however, there's only one pool of operators, so you could have players on the enemy team with the exact same skin as players on your team. I definitely wanted to bring this up because this is one of the more common complaints I heard about the game throughout its life cycle, that people were having a hard time sorting out teammates from enemies. To be honest, I hardly even noticed because I guess I don't pay too much attention to the operator skins themselves. I pretty much only noticed the red text above the player. In fact, especially with Vanguard's crappy visibility, it was super common for me to get a kill just by looking at the red text and aiming slightly below it. But still, I can understand why this was a common complaint. Combat pacing was one of the bigger features that they marketed the game around. This is a system that they created for matchmaking that would allow you to decide how big you wanted the teams to be in your games. So it's basically an additional quick play filter that determines player count. There were three combat pacings to choose from, tactical, assault, and blitz. Tactical being the traditional experience, assault being slightly more chaotic, and blitz being pure chaos. And it's worth noting that near the end of the game's life cycle, they did take the assault option out of the game, presumably because there weren't enough people playing to support all three pacings for matchmaking. I have mixed feelings about combat pacing. On one hand, it's great to be able to experience each map in three different ways. And it's especially great if you want your matches to be non-stop chaos because you can just only queue into Blitz games. But on the other hand, I do feel like it strips away the unique flow of each map. If you're only playing Blitz, which I did for the first half of the year, every map starts to feel the same. I remember in the multiplayer reveal trailer, they said that the design philosophy behind this was When we were just first talking about it, the idea of making every map into shipment, I love that! And hearing that got me really excited because I love the chaos of shipment. But after some time only playing Blitz, I realized why would I want every map to feel like shipment? Ideally, each map would have its own unique feel. And by the way, the filters you mark are really only preferences because when you're matchmaking, there's always a decent chance that you get put into a game with a combat pacing that you weren't queued for. So yeah, overall, mixed thoughts on this one. If they do it again in the future, hopefully they can find a way to not force players into a pacing they don't want to play, and also a way to retain the identity of each map. So that wraps up all the new features and gimmicks that Sledgehammer added to Vanguard. Let's move on to the Create a Class, starting with its centerpiece, the new Gunsmith. 
This is the most customizable gunsmith experience we've ever had. But before you get too excited, that's not necessarily a good thing. Guns in Vanguard have more mutable traits than they've ever had before. For example, instead of just having a traditional recoil control attribute, Vanguard has recoil control, initial recoil control, sustained recoil control, and hipfire recoil control. If you want your gun to be a laser beam, you're gonna have to find the right balance of all these different attributes. Vanguard also introduces accuracy as a mutable trait. If you're confused about what this does, then you're not alone, because when the game first came out, people had no idea what its effect was. But it turns out that guns in Vanguard aren't actually guaranteed to shoot where you're pointing them. Depending on how high your accuracy stat is, the bullet might veer off from your reticle. Some people call this bloom, but I prefer calling it ADS spread, since I think that makes a little more sense in this context. This was one of the most controversial things added to Vanguard, and and unlike a lot of the other controversies we talked about, I think this one was well deserved. I've been playing Call of Duty for a decade and I can't imagine a worse feeling than placing your reticle perfectly on the enemy's head, pulling the trigger, and having the bullet disappear into the void. You don't even get any visual indicator of how accurate your gun actually is in game. So when that happens, were you missing your shots, is your internet bad, is the hit registration off, or was your gun just not accurate? You'll never know. And these are just the beginning of all the mutable traits that exist in this game. Pretty much every weapon in the game has the option to change both fire rate and damage per bullet. You can modify headshot and body shot multipliers. You can give your gun incendiary rounds. The kit and proficiency slots throw some wild cards into the mix with things like frenzy that will trigger health regen anytime you get a kill. Acrobatic, which reduces movement penalties when changing stance. And vital, which increases the area for critical hits, meaning an upper body shot will do the damage of a headshot shot, which is extremely powerful in Call of Duty. And of course, all these mutable traits are on top of the existing ones we've become accustomed to over the past few years. Things like ADS speed, damage range, sprint to fire speed, etc. So you can already tell that this gunsmith is going to be wild, but the effect is compounded with another big change that they've made. There are now 10 attachment slots for each primary weapon, and you get to fill up all 10. To give you a little perspective, the original Modern Warfare 2 allowed you to have one attachment on your gun, and the first gunsmith from Modern Warfare 2019 allowed you to have five, which seemed like a lot at the time. And now that number has doubled. And since you get to fill 10 out of the 10 slots, this means that you don't even have to make the tactical decision of which slots you're not gonna fill. You're just gonna stack every single one. So if we take MW19 for example, which I still think had the best gunsmith we've seen, you had to weigh the pros and cons of not only each attachment, but each slot. Would you rather have a stock or an extended mag? Would you rather have an optic or a suppressor? These were decisions you had to make because you couldn't fill every attachment slot. But here, since you can fill every slot, you get a much more dumbed down experience. And by now, hopefully you have a much clearer picture of what this gunsmith actually is. More mutable traits than ever before, and more attachments than ever before. At first glance, this might sound awesome. I mean, I know it did to me. For the first month of this game, I was having such a good time with this gunsmith, but sometimes you need some time with something before you can fully understand it. As time went on, I started to see how deeply flawed it was. Imagine each weapon as a block of clay with its own unique shape. Previously, you were only able to make a few changes to the shape of the block, and there were some parts that you couldn't change even if you wanted to. But in Vanguard, it feels like neither of these limitations exist, which begs the question, why does it matter what weapon I pick if I can always mold it into the exact shape that I want? And the answer is that it doesn't. Most weapons in the game can be twisted and contorted to work with most playstyles. And this also comes at the cost of individuality among weapons. They can all be whatever you want them to be. There is no shared experience among the community of what it's like to use the Stig, for example, because it was so vastly different to each person who built it out in their own way. Now, of course, the game doesn't force you to build out all your guns in the same way, but gamers are agents of optimization, and 9 out of 10 times, that's that's what they're gonna do. And the cherry on the tippity top of our gunsmith Sunday is that it creates a massive disparity between guns that are fully leveled and guns that are
are low level. We already kind of covered this in the TTK section earlier. When you're trying a weapon for the first time and you don't have any attachments unlocked for it, you'll be at a huge disadvantage against everyone else using their fully leveled weapons stacked with the optimal attachments. And the only thing you can do is suck it up until you've played enough to use the attachments yourself. I realize Call of Duty has always been like this to some degree, but the disparity has never been this bad. I think that this gunsmith was a fun little experiment, and it was nice to try out for a bit. But the lesson learned here is that there is a such thing as too much customization in the gunsmith, and we definitely crossed that threshold here. I'm glad they were bold enough to try something as wild as this, but I think I've seen everything I need to see. So what about the rest of the creative class? Well, it's slot-based like the last few years have been, which I actually prefer over the Pick 10 system. And apart from the new gunsmith, Vanguard doesn't really try anything new in create a class. There's no wild cards like we saw in Cold War, field upgrades are pretty much the same, and the perk system also sticks to the status quo. But speaking of perks, let's talk about them for a second, because I think they're super important to the metagame of any COD. For the most part, the game includes all the usual suspects. Ghost, Tracker, Overkill, you know, all the ones that are pretty much a part of COD's DNA at this point. It is worth noting that Ninja, or Dead Silence as it's called in Infinity Ward games, makes a return. If you don't know, Ninja is a perk that makes your footsteps much quieter, making it easier to rush around the map without being snuffed out. And since modern Call of Duty has become so competitive, this is extremely useful to players who like to rush around the map. The inclusion of a Ninja perk in Call of Duty has been kind of a hot button topic ever since MW19, which didn't have Ninja as a perk, but a field upgrade instead, which meant that you could only get quieter footsteps for a limited time. Believe me, I am not being dramatic when I say that for some Call of Duty players at the time, this was the end of the world. And I bring that up now because in the Vanguard beta, the Ninja perk was not in the game, and there was a field upgrade for it instead, just like Modern Warfare 2019. But after the beta, they announced that Ninja would be coming to the game as a perk when it launched. So as you can imagine, a lot of players were super thrilled with this decision. And it was also cool that they kept the Ninja field upgrade around as well, to give you even more options for quieter footsteps. Although I will add that in Vanguard, the footstep audio is much quieter than it was in Modern Warfare 2019, so I don't think it's as important here, but still it's nice to have the option. Piercing Vision is a perk in this game that will highlight any enemies that you're shooting at, like this. So they'll be visible through smoke, fire, walls, anything. Like I mentioned earlier, it seems like Sledgehammer really wanted to create an environment with all sorts of effects that could harm visibility, making this perk pretty much invaluable. Especially since you don't even have to actually hit the enemy in order to get them highlighted. I can't tell you how many kills I've gotten in this game just by blindly firing my gun somewhere to see if an enemy outline appears. Of course, you can counter this by running Dauntless, which makes it so that your outline won't appear to anyone shooting you, which I always did, but still, this is one of the more powerful perks we've seen in COD over the past few years. In terms of lethals and tacticals, one thing that I did love about this creative class is that there's no Claymore or Bouncing Betty, meaning you can run around freely without having to worry about running into a mine that's gonna end your kill streak. My go-to tactical over the past few years has been the Stim, which instantly triggers health regeneration. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's next to useless in this game. When you compare it to the stim from Black Ops Cold War, which was god tier, this thing is pretty much useless. The animation is like a year long in Call of Duty time, you can't shoot your weapon when you pull the stim out, and when you also consider the fast time to kill of the game, there's not a lot of situations where the stim is actually going to be useful. But I'll admit that this one is more of just a personal gripe. So Vanguard overall had a very by the numbers create a class, with the one big exception being the gunsmith. I respect the boldness of the gunsmith even if it didn't pan out, and I am happy that they added ninja as a perk. But other than that, I wasn't super impressed with it. Moving on to the maps, I think this is one of Vanguard's strengths. Over the past few years, Call of Duty has struggled to find a balance between complex, dense maps and more traditional three-lane maps. For example, MW19 was heavily criticized for having maps that were too porous, and Black Ops Cold War was criticized for having maps that were too linear. I think Vanguard has found a pretty decent compromise between the two. We have smaller, more straightforward maps like DOS House, and we have bigger, more Modern Warfare-esque maps like Red Star. This adds some fantastic variety to the way that the game plays from map to map. Sometimes you want that traditional, fast-paced, three-lane Call of Duty experience, and other times you might want a more strategic and thoughtful 
full experience. In either case, Vanguard has a little something for you. My personal favorite new map would have to be Eagle's Nest, which is a simple, medium-sized map with a three-lane design. There's a building in the center of the map which really shows off Vanguard's new destructible environments as the place gets trashed throughout the game, and it's surrounded by two outside lanes for more long-range engagements. I also have to commend Sledgehammer for the settings and color palettes of each map. Even if you don't like the way that these maps play, you have to admit that most of them are at least visually interesting. For example, Decoy, which is a mock town for military training, complete with fake houses and businesses. Or Mayhem, which is set in a movie studio as a reference to Godzilla. If you don't know, for the old Godzilla movies, they used to make these miniature cities to put a normal-sized Godzilla into in order to make him look massive by comparison. So the map takes place in one of those mini cities on a movie set, making you feel about Godzilla's size. Or how about Beheaded, which takes place in a ravaged New York City, with the decapitated head of the Statue of Liberty being a part of the map. Those are some of the more wild settings that we got, but I also appreciate the sheer amount of unique biomes in the game as well. Red Star being a snow map, Desert Siege being a desert map, Hotel Royale taking place in a fancy hotel at nighttime, Gavutu with palm trees and a tropical vibe, and Casablanca taking place during a beautiful sunset. For me personally, this kind of visual variety goes a long way. And even though, like I mentioned earlier, Vanguard's graphics have have this smooth, almost cartoony look to them that kind of bothers me, I do like the general art direction of this game. In my Advanced Warfare video, I was also praising Sledgehammer for their map design, and it looks like they did it again here. Although, I want to point out that, depending on which modes you were queued for in quick play, not every map would be in the rotation. So if you only queued for TDM or Domination, then there were some maps that you would just never play on, as a result of some weird matchmaking bug, I guess. Sledgehammer did address this in some patch notes at one point, but I don't know if it was ever truly fixed. As for game modes, we didn't get a ton of new stuff, and as usual with recent Call of Duty games, there's a plethora of modes that we've seen in past games that never showed up here. They marketed a new game mode called Champions Hill really hard before launch, but it seems like once the game came out, they forgot about it entirely. This was essentially a tournament with teams of two and a cash system that would allow you to buy upgrades in between rounds. It's an evolution of MW19's 2v2 mode, Gunfight. I thought this was a pretty cool idea, although, admittedly, I didn't play it much. And maybe that was the case for everyone else too, and that's why Sledgehammer didn't want to talk about it after launch. I also want to say that there was a depressing lack of party game modes in Vanguard. I really miss the days of One in the Chamber, Sticks and Stones, or even Infection being regulars in any COD game. It's always nice to have modes like those that are a little less sweaty, but recently we've been seeing less and less of those party games. Also, where is Capture the Flag? Maybe it's just the Halo player in me, but I love CTF and I've always wanted COD to flesh out the mode a little bit more. But instead, for Vanguard, they just axed it entirely. There are two new modes that Sledgehammer put into the game that I want to call out, though. Overclocked, which had increased health and no kill streaks. I don't think we've ever had a mode in Call of Duty that gave everyone extra health, and considering the TTK problem that we talked about earlier, I loved this mode. And it was also nice to enjoy the game without constant kill streak spam. And the other mode is Patrol, which is essentially hardpoint but with a moving zone. It's a simple twist, but I loved it and I played a lot of it throughout the year. So one thing that I always look forward to with the new Call of Duty multiplayer is the mastery camo grind. I know that camo grinders are a dying breed nowadays, but it's important to me, so we're gonna talk about it real quick. And to sum it up, this was my least favorite camo grind ever. In order to unlock the camo challenges for each weapon, you first need to get it to max level, which already takes too long. Once you have the challenges unlocked, most of them are the same challenges that we have every year. Headshots, long shots, five kill streaks, and all that. But there are three new challenges for each weapon, where it will make you put three specific attachments on your gun, and then do one of the other basic Basic challenges again, for example, long shots. The camo grind was already too slow to begin with, and for me, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Not only does this mean that you'll likely have to do the same challenge twice unless you wait until all your challenges are unlocked to start doing them, but also you can only make progress towards one of these last three challenges at a time, since they each require you to have a specific set of attachments on your gun. My favorite thing about doing these camo challenges is that most of the time it feels like an optimization puzzle. You look at all the challenges that need to be done and think, how can I get the most of these done in one single game? By staying crouched and hip firing my SMG at close range, or hanging back and getting long shots with my sniper and going for kill streaks. I love planning that stuff out. But since these are the last three challenges to be unlocked and you can only do one of them at a time, that means you'll most likely be stuck at a snail's pace as you're forced to use these crappy attachments 
and do more challenges that you've already done. It's terrible. I've been wanting them to overhaul the camo challenge system for some time now, to have it make more sense, be less boring, and more rewarding. So hopefully we see that soon. The actual mastery camo itself, however, called Atomic this time around, I think looks beautiful. It looks like Damascus from MW19, but with more yellow and orange. But I do have to say that I don't like it quite as much as Damascus, which was the perfect camo in my opinion. I guess I'm just not a fan of these camos with rolling patterns like Atomic has. I don't know, it just always makes me feel like I'm looking at something that was originally a green screen and then had a video slapped over it. Since Call of Duty in recent years has taken on the live service game model, I figured I'd start dedicating a section of these videos to the live service aspects of the game. This is actually one of the more important elements to a modern Call of Duty game, since players nowadays expect the game to feel more fresh and fun over a longer period of time. Vanguard launched with a whopping 16 maps built for 6v6, which is twice as many as Black Ops Cold War did the previous year. And like we talked about in the maps section, I think these were good maps. So how are they able to pull something like this off? Well, unfortunately, it seems like all they did was just shuffle around the map distribution for the year. The game did launch with more maps than any modern COD has, but it also got less post-launch maps than any modern COD has. Vanguard only got two maps per season, and that's including Remake. And the game only had five seasons, whereas every other live service COD had six. So this means by the end of year one, other Call of Duty games had caught up to it in terms of total map count. I'll go ahead and throw up a crappy graph that I made so that you can see what I mean. Two maps per season isn't a terrible number, you can see that most live service Call of Duties have had seasons like that, but you'll also see that the other games had seasons where three or even four maps were added to the game. Not to mention that additional sixth season which, like I said, Vanguard did not have. What you end up with here is a very fun first couple months with Vanguard where you have an abundance of maps to play, followed by 10 months of a slow and boring drip feed of two maps per season. And I want to reiterate that this is even more boring when one of those two maps is a remake that you're already familiar with. Now look, I'm gonna share a controversial opinion of mine here, so go easy on me. There's a lot of negative sentiment around live service games because they tend to cut content from the launch of the game in order to give it to you later on and act like they've done you some huge favor, when really they've just withheld content from you for the sake of keeping you you playing long term. Don't get me wrong, this can be an evil practice, but my controversial opinion is that there is a right way to do it. To show you what I mean, let's compare Black Ops Cold War with Vanguard, since they seem to take two very different approaches, but both ended up with 26 maps at the end of year one. Cold War launched with only eight maps, presumably so that they could give us more maps throughout the game's life cycle, like season one, for example, which gave us four new maps if you include Nuketown. I am not only okay with this, but I prefer this, given the fact that 8 maps is enough to keep me satisfied until Season 1, which started about a month after the game launched. Vanguard, on the other hand, gave us a huge content dump at launch with 16 maps. But like we talked about, this doesn't necessarily mean that they had more maps ready to go at launch than COD normally does. Since the game ended its run with an average number of maps, we can assume that the plan was to provide less maps throughout the year in order to launch with a few extra. I know some people are going to hate me for that opinion, but I'm a simple man. I like having consistent high quality updates over time more than a super high quality launch and then a dead live service. And over on the weapon front, things are a little bit better, launching with 38 weapons and adding an average of 3 every season. But this is where my issues with the gunsmith that we talked about earlier come into play again. Every weapon is so customizable that they all start to feel the same, and it gets a little less exciting each time there's a new weapon added. With maybe the exception of the last few weapons that they added to the game like the historically accurate laser beam gun, which did feel pretty unique. I was also annoyed that they only seemed to care about adding in assault rifles and SMGs and left most of the other weapon classes out to dry. I guess that's another factor that added into new weapons feeling stale. It was almost always an assault rifle or an SMG. Over the past few years, they've been trying to create a running narrative throughout the seasons of the game's life cycle. So when a new season drops, there will be a little cinematic or something that they'll drop online that tells 
tells a new part of the story. Compared to something like Apex Legends or Overwatch, these have always felt a little weak to me, but it was especially weak in Vanguard. The narrative was so boring and made so little sense that near the end of the game's life cycle, I would actually get embarrassed when they dropped these cinematics because I'm pretty sure that no one cared. I'm all for creating an ongoing narrative throughout the year, but if they want to pull it off, it's going to take a little more effort than this. For example, instead of just a cinematic, maybe a playable campaign-like mission that would be released with each season. That would make it much easier for players to get involved and to tell, you know, an actual story. Of course, every season came with a full 100 tier battle pass, where 90 of those tiers was stuff that you didn't care about. This year we did get some new types of battle pass filler though, like these new kill cam frames, which are definitely something. And the operator skins here are as wild as they've ever been. Yes, the game does technically have a World War II setting, but looking at most of the skins, you probably wouldn't believe that. And like I said at the outset, I don't care about historical accuracy within a Call of Duty game, but I do feel strongly about having thematic consistency, and these skins are all over the place. Although to be fair, Call of Duty has been like this for a few years now, so this isn't just a Vanguard problem. And I think that these cosmetics are a result of the poor reception of the World War II setting. It seems like maybe they wanted to show everyone that a World War II game could still be fun and crazy, so they added in all these wild cosmetics. Another item that they introduced as Battle Pass fodder are these little outro animations that play at the end of each game as you vote for the match MVP, which is also a new feature. The animations themselves are nothing special, and being able to vote for an MVP every match is actually pretty cool for maybe the first five times that you do it. And then you realize that the voting part of the match is unskippable and locks you in completely. This is probably to force you to watch these animations that people are potentially spending their hard-earned COD points on. This was extremely annoying for me, so I just got in the habit of keeping an eye on the score of the match so I could dip at the last second and miss the voting entirely. Something else that's really started to bother me with these battle passes is that none of the cosmetics, as wild as they can, be sometimes even look that cool to me anyway. They usually save all the really good stuff for their own $20 bundles, and then all the generic stuff goes to the battle pass. I could make an entire video whining about how modern Call of Duty is monetized, but for the purpose of this video, I'll just say the skins in Vanguard were random, ugly, and overpriced. I think you could find better cosmetic design in pretty much any other popular AAA shooter. But it's not all bad news with the battle passes in Vanguard, because they did do one thing that I actually thought was really cool. For seasons one and two, they added new perks to the game via the battle pass. Everyone always fixates on getting new weapons post-launch, but I'd argue that new perks can be just as refreshing for the game. And they hardly ever add new ones after the game's been released, so this is pretty cool. And I know people complain about it being in the battle pass because that technically could make it pay to win for players who buy the battle pass tiers outright and get the perks instantly. But in this case, it doesn't bother me too much. I like having something to work toward while I'm playing, and like we talked about, the Battle Pass isn't really offering anything else valuable these days. So it was nice to have those perks in there, and I wish they would have done this for every season. We did get a handful of crossover events in Vanguard with Attack on Titan, Umbrella Academy, Terminator, and Godzilla vs. Kong. Like I mentioned, thematically, none of these really make any sense. And also, I don't think any of the skins were particularly well designed, beside maybe the Terminator one. The real shame of these events is that they go through all this work to get the rights to make some cosmetics, and then they put them in the shop for 20 bucks and that's it. There's no new maps, weapons, modes, or anything that's actually playable with these crossovers. If you weren't willing to shell out the cash, then the Attack on Titan crossover meant nothing to you. And even if you were, it's all still only cosmetic. Unless you're a Warzone player, because with some of these events, there actually was some playable content added over there. Not surprising, considering how unpopular Vanguard is compared to Warzone. The last thing I want to cover in the live service section is the post launch technical support by Sledgehammer. Things like bug fixes and weapon tuning over the course of the year. As usual, when the game launched in November 2021, Sledgehammer was very outspoken, talking about how they wanted a stronger line of communication this year, and about how they were going to be making changes based on community feedback, you know, the usual BS. For example, like I mentioned earlier, they added the ninja perk to the game after that was one of the biggest requests throughout the game's beta. However, when the game launched, there were some serious balancing issues within the gunsmith. Smith. Remember how we talked about how insane the weapon customization is in this game? Well, as it turns out, this can be tough to balance. I'm talking about an MP40 build that could two-shot to the chest, and also shotguns that could do this. 
my no god. Two. Shit, I'm oh, oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. And the thing is that I'm not too bothered by this type of thing when a Call of Duty game launches. There are always bound to be some balancing issues. But I'd say that these issues were way more game breaking than usual, and where it normally takes a Call of Duty developer a week or maybe even a couple of days to fix something as severe as this after launch, it took Sledgehammer closer to a month. And it's not like the game was super buggy or anything, so it seemed to me like these balancing issues would have been one of their top priorities. And even after they got all that initial stuff fixed, the same thing happened happened again when they added the incendiary grenade in December. This thing was like a Molotov mixed with a smoke grenade mixed with an atomic bomb. One of the most overpowered lethals to be added to any Call of Duty in recent memory. To be honest, I don't know how something like this even gets past playtesting since it's so obviously better than any other lethal in the game. But it got added to the game all the same and again it took Sledgehammer about a month to fix this. I think 10 years from now what people will actually remember about this game, if anything, will be the hell experience of running around Christmas shipment in December 2021 when everyone was running the hopelessly broken incendiary grenade. The post-launch support overall for Vanguard was pitiful, and that means a lot coming from me because I'm normally the type of guy that's willing to cut the devs some slack. After all, I do feel like game development is much more complex than the average gamer thinks it is. But Sledgehammer went silent for long periods of time, took way too long to fix trivial things like weapon balancing, and could only muster up two maps per season over over only five seasons. To be clear, I'm not expecting them to keep me fully engaged with the game over the entire year because let's face it, that's pretty much impossible these days, but I do expect at least a little more than this. Especially when they make all of these promises at the beginning of the year, and especially when we've seen better within the Call of Duty franchise. In conclusion, while Vanguard does have some redeeming qualities, I don't think it really excels in any area. The campaign featured the usual linear gameplay with yet another traditional World War II story. The zombies mode was so far off the mark that I honestly have a hard time even calling it Call of Duty Zombies, and the multiplayer, while fun on the surface level, had lots of flaws deep within its design. Things like the gunsmith, which was probably the biggest change to the game, ended up making each gun feel the same. Or the combat pacing matchmaking system, which ended up making each map feel the same. It's because of stuff like this and the lackluster post-launch support that made the game not hold up in the long term. But thanks to fast-paced movement, the game's saving grace in my opinion, opinion, and some solid map design, I personally was still able to have a good amount of fun with the game, even if it did wear off much quicker than it would have with the average Call of Duty release. Sledgehammer set out to create a high-octane multiplayer experience, and to their credit, I think they did that. But we live in the age of games as a service, and making a good game is no longer just a sprint, it's a marathon. And I think that is one of Vanguard's biggest failures. At the end of the day, I hate to say it, but I don't think many people will remember this game fondly. In fact, lots Lots of people probably won't even remember it at all. The game underperformed in sales, and while Activision doesn't share the numbers, I'm sure the monthly active users were also way down year over year. So this was a Call of Duty game that not a lot of COD players bought, and for those who did buy it, they didn't end up playing it that much. I'm happy that they took a shot at creating a new COD franchise with Vanguard, instead of just making another Black Ops or Modern Warfare title. But unfortunately, this one was a bit of a misfire. I feel like if the setting had been a little more exciting, then maybe more more people would have given it a shot. But without the brand recognition and the community tired of the World War II setting altogether, the game was pretty much dead on arrival. And so it's only a matter of time until it fades into absolute obscurity. And to be honest, even though I did have my fun with the game, I'm okay with that. Thank you for watching and stay gold.